having me yet another time. Uh, this time, definitely with a completely different presentation, um, quite different from the ones that you've seen in the first session as well. In the first session, uh, we have heard about functional programming, compositionality, and basically, we've spoken about techniques for implementing, for writing programs. Um, I will... Oh, so this, this does not bode well. I guess this screen will not be black in a second anymore. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I can, I can uh, do the intro. There's basically just one thing that needs to be on the screen, but that's not yet. So, um, yes, so uh, instead of talking about the techniques, uh, so I will not tell you how to write every line in your code. Um, in fact, I will not show you any code, not in Scala and not in any, any other language. I will talk about the other end of this whole problem. Uh, I will talk about why are we writing code, what is the problem that we are solving, and, um, and go from there. Uh, the, ah, so the source where this is coming from is that two and a half years ago I co-founded Actix and have been um, creating software for the manufacturing industry since then. So I have got to know, uh, I've gotten to know a completely new problem space, a new industry, and that has uh, had an effect on how I think about programming and uh, how, I, how I approach it, and I wanted to share you, with you some of the lessons that I learned along the way. So, who here has been in a factory, in a real factory? Yeah, that's a few hands. Who here has even worked in a factory? Huh? That's also a few hands, but uh, by no means the majority. So. Uh, let's uh, let's quickly quickly talk about. Uh, oh, I hope the video will work then. Um, so uh, let's quickly talk about what a factory is. When you when you picture a factory, you see something. There's probably robots moving and goods moving and people doing things on machines and so on. And uh, you might see factories uh, in the news, it's uh, then usually car factories or other big, big factories. Uh, but when I say factory, uh, I might mean something like, like this. Yeah, so, so this is a factory. This is a machine that produces glass bottles in uh, a certain factory. Uh, it's not at all clean. Nothing is clean around it. Um, and uh, it's very hot and extremely noisy. Uh, it is, it is uh, an environment that you would not really want to be in if you had a choice. Uh, but people are working there and uh, they are producing these glass bottles and they are of course proud of it uh, that they are operating these awesome machines because there's molten glass dropping in, uh, into this machine uh, from the top at 1400 degrees Celsius uh, and then it's formed and blown and so on, and uh, the machine produces like 600 bottles a minute or so. So this is a pretty awesome, uh, awesome machine, I would say. So this is a factory. Um, then, when we talk about pushing to production, when we talk about production use, um, as has been uh, mentioned in previous presentations here, uh, what do we mean, what is a production system? Uh, I've used uh, this picture quite a bit in previous presentations. Um, it, it's what you see when, when, when you close your eyes and think production system, I think. It's a computing center, you deploy software there, uh, it runs and we want to make it scale and resilient and, and all the things that have been talked about. But that is not what a production system actually is in my current life. This instead is a production system. Yeah, this is uh, the control cabinet of some machine that does something completely different from the glass manufacturing. Uh, incidentally, um, you see control, uh, you see electricity here, you see control controllers, microcontrollers, um, PLCs, you, you see some IoT devices. So, so this is what makes a machine work. This is in the end what the factory needs so that the machine works uh, so that the factory can do what it's supposed to do. So, with these introductions, um, what does a factory do? We need to look at this a bit in order to, to understand 
the, the constraints and, uh, and, and the situation that we are going to uh, be programming for. So a factory, this is a, a factory. Uh, a factory has a purpose. Well, the, high, the most high-level purpose is, of course, to make money. Nobody builds a factory um, if they don't want to make money with it. Making money with it means uh, it produces something. The factory produces something, and then that can be sold, or it's produced uh, in commission for, for someone. So these are output materials that come out of the factory. No factory just creates output materials from nothing. Even if you package air, you need to have some sort of input materials. Uh, these input materials would then be the packaging. But normally, um, input materials can be whatever. You could make uh, a, a, cog, a cog wheel from steel. Yeah? You, you could um, make uh, a pizza from the, the different ingredients. So whatever it is, you have input materials that go into the factory. Then you need many more things, because these inputs do not magically turn into the outputs. So you need the machines, you need the tools to, to make it happen. Um, uh, these can be robots, these can be a, a torque wrench, um, can be a file, can be many things. Then, of course, uh, you, you still need human labor. There is no machine, uh, no, no factory that consists entirely of robots. So uh, we need to put in effort to turn the inputs into the outputs, and we will use the machines and the tools. And uh, many of these need electricity and lubricants and all sorts of consumables. So all these come in from the side. Um, they are used in the process that turns inputs into outputs. And of course, no such conversion is lossless or, or flawless. Um, sometimes inputs are bad. Sometimes there's just parts that will not be converted. Sometimes uh, something breaks. So you create a car engine and you test it and it doesn't work. Um, that leads to waste. Uh, waste, of course, is an undesirable product that we want to minimize. OK, so the, the, to make the factory a success, what do we need to do? We need to create as many outputs uh, as possible from as little inputs and uh, labor, machines, consumables um, as we can, producing as little waste as possible, because waste always also has cost money. Now, this is an overall view of the whole factory. If you look into the factory, a factory consists of exactly this process chained together in multiple steps. Um, all factories that I've been to um, uh, do this without exception. There is there's no such thing of, of just having exactly one step, and that's, that's all. So we have this, this diagram. Inputs get turned into outputs using all these uh, labor tools and, and consumables. And that produces some intermediate output material that turns into the input material for the next step, and so on and so on. So this is how a factory works. In internally. Now, a small uh, 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 a bit of context is needed on on the market that we are looking at. Now we are producing software for some sort of market, and we need to consider who are the players in this market. Uh, most of the factories, and we are operating in Germany, most of the German factories are small. There are about 60,000 factories with less than 1,000 employees um, in Germany, uh, and there's just a few big ones. So like, like the 0.01% are the big ones, and then there's lots of small factories. And these small factories usually don't have a huge turnover, um, and they, they don't make huge profits, it's just smaller. Uh, so if you want to sell them software, you need to take that into account. If you're, for example, um, SAP and uh, your pricing model is that you need to, uh, that your licenses cost like 300k a year, then there's a certain, there's a whole class of businesses that will never be able to buy this because it's simply not worth it at their scale. So uh, now, do you have some sort of image in your mind like what I'm talking about? Yeah, small mid-sized factories, not the huge ones. That's important in the following. Okay, now 
we talk about the typical IT systems that we find in these factories. Um, who here knows what an ERP system is or does? Um, yeah, it's, it's the, I think it's the, the, the most widely used business software, but uh, not all prog programmers know it. Uh, it's uh, enterprise resource planning, which means it deals with the customer orders that come in with the resources that you have, the machines, uh, also with the personnel in your, in your factory. Uh, it deals with the manufacturing orders that you generate from the sales orders in order to produce something. Uh, it deals with the invoicing and so on. So that's the business side of things. Uh, it does not look at what happens on the actual shop floor with the actual machines. Then, uh, the document management system. Well, there are hundreds, hundreds of document management systems. The most widely used is called uh, Windows File Share. I don't know whether you know that one. So, uh, yeah, well, anything you, put, you can put your documents uh, where they can then be retrieved and displayed and, and so on. Then uh, we have business intelligence tools. Um, people want to see reports. They want to see how they're doing, how the factory is doing. Uh, want to see whether things are improving, declining, where am I making profits, uh, where am I making losses, and so on. Um, I guess the most widely deployed business intelligence tool is Excel, fed from various sources. Usually someone looks at some sheets of paper and types stuff into Excel. Then we have computer-aided quality. Uh, so th this is a, another tool for managing all the QA processes, the uh, reference drawings or the reference values for measurements and so on. So it's, it's kind of like a DMS but for, for quality. And we have of course uh, various um, devices mostly printers, but scales, torque wrenches, I mean, whatever you have you, um, the access control with the cards and so on. Okay, so now for just a little bit of context, uh, what Actix does. So we have this uh, enterprise software and we have the personnel and then they communicate. Uh, they need to know, so the personnel at the machine needs, needs to know what to do essentially. Uh, and the enterprise software needs to know when it was done. And this typically in these small factories is mediated by paper. Something is printed out, someone writes on it, I've done it, and it was a thousand pieces, and 12 were bad, or something like that. Also, um, device, devices and machines are connected, usually still via paper uh, in this scenario. So someone notes down, yeah, it has produced that and that amount, and now the next maintenance needs to be done, things like that. And essentially, we're trying to replace the paper by software. Um, it's, it's, this is, this is uh, perhaps uh, only a first order approximation, but it's very, very useful, a very useful use case. Okay, now let's look at some data sources because we will be shipping data through the factory uh, from these different sources to who if, whoever needs it. So let's characterize the da these data sources because this is not the Twitter firehose. Um, the ERP system is operated by humans. Uh, you put in data on, on orders. It's order of kilobytes. A specification of what is to, produ to be produced is, is not tiny, but also not big. Uh, documents in a document management system, well, they can be megabytes. Um, anything the personnel does, so when we are looking at a touch screen and someone presses buttons like start and stop, um, that generates just a few bytes each. And it happens at a frequency that a human interacts with a computer, so per minute or per hour, so it, it's really not much data. And all devices that are used by human typically have this characteristic. If the device were a camera, for example, then it could be megabytes, but it will probably not be every second. So everything in the first four rows is really the opposite of big data. It, it's tiny data. Um, the, the, the last row is more interesting in, in that regard because machines can produce enormous amounts of data. Uh, they can produce monitoring values on a per second or even per millisecond basis. Uh, or they could even, for example, take a photograph of every glass bottle produced by that machine you've seen. Now, that's actually done there. So that's a lot of data then. But uh, if we discount that, uh, it's mostly tiny data. So 
With this context, now you, now you understand kind of the, the problem domain a little bit, uh, we can take a look at how we tackled this. Uh, what was the first version of the architecture? Um, this was just, um, I mean, it's a startup, so searching for product market fit, you don't build the real thing first, so you just use something to get a, get a rough idea of whether it can be valuable. So we cho chose um, what's readily, readily available and what we knew uh, at the time. So we used the typical, I would say, cloud architecture where we have uh, devices there in the factory, down there, symbolized. So left one is a tablet for a human interaction, then a barcode uh, or a um, QR code scanner, then the, the gear is, is symbol for all kinds of machines, sensors that you might uh, interact with. Then you have the screen, which is uh, someone's PC or a dashboard on, on, uh, hanging on the wall uh, that displays some data. And then you have this server icon over there, uh, which stands for all the enterprise software that you need to connect to. And uh, so, so this is the connector to the SAP system, for example. Um, now, all of these are on the edge, as we say nowadays, and they kind of have a mirror in the cloud because um, you don't really want to be on site everywhere, so we want it uh, to be cloud-based uh, to ease all the deployments and potentially support many customers. Uh, so yes, cloud is the way to go. And uh, so every, every device, every IoT device has a link to a microservice that lives in the cloud. The microservices um, were imp implemented using the Lagom framework uh, with uh, persistence done by Cassandra database. Um, in this case, it's all hosted by AWS, so I think it's a pretty much standard way of doing things. Now, what are the good parts? First of all, it's very much established. Uh, it's, it's a rock-solid programming model. Uh, we have tools, we know how it works. Um, you, you write these, these HTTP-based exchanges, and uh, yeah, basically it's, it's a known thing. Um, the clouds have gotten really good at supporting various things, uh, setting up the security infrastructure and everything. So that's really excellent what you can buy there off the shelf. Uh, and of course, we have good standards for edge connectivity. It's all, it's basically figured out. Now, it does have some drawbacks, um, which come into play because of the domain that we, that we are looking at. One thing that is very important here is it's very much dependent on the network. As soon as the internet connection for some reason gets flaky, things start failing. So I use the scanner uh, on my goods, whatever, a pallet of, of uh, uh, car, um, packaging material or something, and it makes beep, but it doesn't show me the data because the cloud is unavailable. That's really not good. Um, if the internet connection going down means that the factory now stops, that is catastrophic. Because um, not only does the internet connection go down from time to time just because, uh, quality is not always perfect, it also becomes an attack vector of to, to press for ransom from these uh, companies. This has happened to hospitals in Germany uh, already. So. Uh, Making the whole architecture depend on that, on that pipe to the internet is flawed for factories. It just, that's just not how it will work. Um, also, the, the cloud provider itself could have problems, or the deployment there could have problems. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, people don't like it when their factory depends on something that's not, that's not in the factory. And there's another one, uh, and that is, uh, so the first one is, you could argue and you could try to convince people. Uh, the second one, not so much, um, because there are cases when, for example, work instructions or production data, like measurements of quantities um, of uh, the accuracies and, and everything, these data could be uh, private, could be not allowed to leave the premises. Um, by contracts with customers, that's frequently the case uh, in the automotive industry. So, in this case, 
using the cloud in the way that was depicted is simply not an option because we cannot store the data in Cassandra in the cloud. Uh, that's not how it works. Okay, so we knew that from the beginning. So architecture V2 was basically in the back of the mind uh, from the beginning. And then as, as we learned, uh, the architecture sharpened and uh, grew more uh, fleshed, uh, in, uh, in, uh, fleshed out. So actually, uh, actually, I cannot say serverless, unfortunately, because that term has been um, bereft of its true meaning. Uh, we actually use less servers. So uh, it's not just someone else's server. We, we just don't use servers for certain things. So how does it work? Um, we have the same devices on the shop floor. We need them. Yeah, we have the tablets, the scanners, uh, the dashboards, the machines, and also the integration to, uh, to enterprise software. And we still use the cloud because it's an awesome tool. Uh, but we use it for device management. So this means that the devices do not depend on the cloud for their primary function, but we can still install security updates, uh, see whether they are healthy, and so on, and, uh, and check under normal conditions. Um, uh, if the internet connection goes down, then the only thing that does not work is the device management. Now, how, where do we run the code? I mean, where do we deploy the business logic? Uh, how, how shall it all work? Because we have, for example, a production order that's on this machine. This tablet knows about it. And then this box of half-finished screws goes over there. Uh, so the guys over there need to know the status, how many screws are supposed to be there, and what's supposed to be done with them. So there needs to be some sort of communication going on. Um, so this is done in this architecture in a completely peer-to-peer -peer fashion on the shop floor. The devices themselves run the business logic. There is no backend in the backend. Yeah, there is no backend in the cloud. There's uh, the front end and the back end, for example, run both on the tablet or both on the scanner. And then you have communication between these devices. Um, this is completely independent of the cloud, obviously. Uh, when the cloud goes away, device management goes away. Yes, OK, that's uh, not nice, but tolerable. Everything continues to work. There's one thing um, you might say. Why don't you use an on-premise cloud instead of this? Because this, this clearly looks newfangled, not really uh, uh, known how to work it, and so on. So the problem is, we're talking uh, about factories that don't have an IT department. Uh, they have one person that's typically one person that's responsible for making sure that the computers run, that run the ERP system. They know how to work, uh, how, how Excel works. Uh, they can set up Windows file shares. But uh, I think they would be completely going nuts if we told them that now they have to manage a Kafka cluster or figure out zookeeper issues, right? So, so this, is, this is why there is no central part. Um, there is no service that we deploy. It's actually serverless, not just uh, in this Lambda naming. OK, there's one more thing that we need. Um, the factory itself will have limited capacity. Now, we, if we store everything on these devices, um, it, it will we'll run out of storage eventually, and for that, uh, for, for the data that can be sent in the cloud and that shall be kept, um, we can store that in the cloud. We can still make use of this uh, practically unlimited resource, um, but in a, in a more indirect fashion, in a, in, a, in a less disruptive fashion. So if this uplink to the cloud doesn't work for a day or two or even a week, that's usually not a biggie. Um, Another thing that is very nicely available in the cloud is business intelligence. Uh, so uh, that's why I wrote Azure SQL here. We happen to use Microsoft for, for that part. Um, there are a gazillion tools like that that, that can, could be used, um, but they all are more comfortable uh, using from the cloud. So the, the data that you want to see on dashboards um, is going to go to the cloud, and then that part is going to be solved there. But again, if the dashboard doesn't work for a day or two, it's no biggie. The factory will still run, right? 
Okay. So let's talk about some consequences this has. So this environment that we're in, and the architecture and the constraints. Um, how shall we architect the solution? Which are the patterns that we see uh, first and foremost, and 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 what is important? Uh, the, worst, uh, the, the, the most important thing here is the let it crash pattern. We have the business logic deployed not as is typical in the cloud with clients in your hands. Um, the business logic is really running exactly within the hands of the operators or uh, um, workers on the shop floor. So it is really deployed on the edge. This has a few consequences. Uh, namely, that very frequently we encounter outages. Um, people just unplug machines. And then if you have something in this control cabinet and someone hit the, the kill switch, then our Raspberry Pi, for example, is dead. Yeah, and we need to deal with that. Or someone just uh, doesn't like the tablet and switches it off or doesn't understand a failure or whatever. Well, it's off. Or the, the Wi-Fi network um, is not perfectly maintained. This is not a university campus. Um, so it might just be unavailable for a few hours until it's fixed. So we, there are really more frequent, way more frequent failures affecting the hardware where the actual business logic runs compared to deploying that business logic in a computing center. Then, of course, the devices themselves are, uh, experience a lot more stress. Um, it's, I think it's highly unlikely that a server at the Amazon uh, computing center is run over by a forklift. Um, but this happens um, to the scanners, for example, or the, the, the tablets. We've had these cases already. And there's another thing. Um, end users are not always completely friendly. So, uh, well, they, you might say they, they are not completely friendly to the Twitter client either, but um, if, the, if there is no uh, separation between where the business logic runs and where the user is, then the influence of, of that, um, of users trying ways to somehow make the system misbehave, uh, is, is more pronounced. So this, this, these are the reasons why the let it crash pattern uh, is listed first here. Uh, what it means is we need to make the software as resilient as we can possibly make it, um, whoever tries to kill it for whatever reason. Uh, let it crash is, uh, about, is not about the crash. Let it crash is about making sure that the software can start gracefully and successfully again, no matter when and how it was killed. That's the let it crash pattern. And uh, that's, that's the most important part here. The second one, um, I told you the, if, if knowledge is disseminated, not on paper anymore, but via the software system, and if this knowledge transfer from one station to the next is crucial to keeping the factory running, that means we need to have really reliable messaging. How do we do that? Uh, first of all, and I, uh, John already mentioned uh, the, the gridlock situation, if you don't have queues, uh, reliable does not mean synchronous. Uh, if, you, uh, if you do synchronous communication from one uh, uh, producer to one consumer, that means as long as the consumer is not ready, the producer is blocked and, and cannot continue. So this means cascading failures and, and all the, the, the bad things that you don't want to happen. No, you need to make sure that every party can continue as long uh, as it has power and, and, and can run, uh, but still communication needs to be as reliable as possible. This means that the consumer needs to be able to consume the messages whenever the consumer is ready. This is pull-based, and at least once. Uh, this pattern is implemented, I mean, you, you, you can pull from the Kafka queue with this offset that you keep and so on. Uh, so this, I think, is well established, and it's important um, to, make, to, make, uh, to make use of this architecture pattern uh, in this case, to achieve the loosest possible coupling while still having reliable messaging. The second one is that uh, communication 
in particular with this pool-based, potentially high-latency communication, is way easier if you focus on facts that will never change. That's what I mean with stone tablets. Yeah, you, could, you could write your, your messages on stone tablets and have it delivered a thousand years later, it would still work. Um, so this is basically event sourcing. Event sourcing means you have an immutable uh, append-only um, event log that you publish your events to, and uh, Avi will talk about that in the next presentation a bit more. The third one, um, perhaps surprising uh, after me being ACA tech lead for so long, uh, so the, the kind of clusters like ACA cluster that have consistent cluster membership are too brittle for this environment. Um, these clusters and the algorithms that they employ work best if communication mostly works and if devices mostly work, so failures in either of these are rare. They tolerate these failures, but uh, if failures happen all the time, then the cluster will be very busy trying to figure out what to do and not get any real work done. So this is why this consistency has, has a cost um, that hinders us from, from, us uh, from using this. Um, the other approach that is more resilient is that whoever is listening, I'll just broadcast everything. There is no consistent cluster in that sense. It's a, it's a very weakly defined notion of a cluster, but you can just continue gossiping all you know, um, and uh, whoever hears it will hear it, and you keep, continue, uh, keep sending that all the time, so at least once delivery is guaranteed if uh, all nodes eventually come back. Yeah, so that's, that's it on messaging. And the last one, um, the domain itself, the domain of manufacturing, the kind of factories and the processes that they use, the terminology that they use, is quite complex and quite diverse. Uh, every factory is slightly different, um, and we, we need to take this into account. Um, we need to build the proper model so that people can understand what is happening, and that precisely is domain-driven design. So I highly recommend that. Um, when defining the events, for example, in your event sourcing approach, um, to use uh, domain-driven design to have meaningful uh, domain objects, meaningful events that come from the actual business domain and that can be explained to, for example, the production manager who has no clue about programming. Uh, programming. You can still discuss what happens in which sequence on, on a workstation or a machine or with a person and they will be able to grasp that and you can communicate and that is extremely important. And then, I mean, applying the, the, uh, the events, that's the business logic and that's mostly just the state monad. So I, I guess all of you have heard enough about that this, uh, this morning already, so I'll be brief here. Okay. So, just to recap, uh, important patterns for resilient peer-to-peer -peer, uh, factory applications. The most important one was let it crash because the environment will crash machines randomly. It's, it's like having the, the, the chaos monkey just completely built into the domain itself. Uh, Coordination-free replication, stone tablets, right, wherever possible. Um, event sourcing domain objects, and pool-based messaging done at least once. So, uh, there's a website corresponding to the book that finally got uh, published last year. Uh, so, this book, uh, if you're interested. And other than that, that brings me to my conclusion. The conclusion is that if we want to have something that's really extremely resilient, we need to loosen the coupling even more. And this implies losing control. Um, this means you don't necessarily know when things will be propagated, when, when these devices will talk to each other. You just need to make sure that whenever they do, it will affect the right thing. And the second one is, 
you cannot foresee all the cases. So there will be edge cases. There will be things you have not thought of. Um, the system might recover, but it recovers in a way that was not entirely specified. Um, and in those cases, you need to foresee that common sense is a really powerful weapon you have against those. So not everything needs to be handled by the system. You just need to display it to real humans and they will deal with it. They are used to it. They fix problems in their processes all the time. So that's, that's a really good fallback if it doesn't happen too often. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>